Hello, class. Mr. Long here. Um, so the last time we were talking, we were discussing the Magna Carta and how important this document was and what it was um, and the importance of it. And a couple things about the Magna Carta, just a quick review. We know King John of England was forced to sign this in 1215. Um, no time before this did any monarch, king or queen, ever have to follow a set of rules and laws um, because they were given divine right. And remember what divine right is. Um, these kings or queens were given their power by God they believed in. And the only person they ever had to answer to was God and no one else. So really, if they wanted to do something, they would just do it. Um, so lots and lots of power for the king and queen and very little rights or freedoms for the people. That all changes after the Magna Carta, after 1215. So what we're going to do is we're going to fast forward about 400 years and discuss what is going on in England um, in the year 1600. Now, the monarch in England is Queen Elizabeth. And Queen Elizabeth has a couple problems going on. First and most importantly, she spends a lot of money. And she leaves England in a huge, huge debt when she dies, and she dies in 1603. And Queen Elizabeth has no son or daughter, which means the throne goes to her next closest relative. And her next closest relative is James Stewart. And James Stewart lives in Scotland, but James Stewart is also the king of Scotland. So now he just has inherited the th English throne also. So he is now king of not only Scotland, but also king of England, which is going to create some problems that we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay. So James the first, guys, he's going to be called James the first. Um, he has many, many problems when he becomes king of England. And he struggles with parliament. He doesn't get along with parliament at all. And his issues with parliament has to do with money. And he needs money, but Parliament doesn't want to give him any money. He also has issues with members within Parliament, the Puritans. Now, we're going to talk about, guys, a lot of different religious groups in this lecture, the Puritans, Presbyterians, the Catholics, the Protestants, um, and so on. But we'll get to that a little later. So the Puritans were hoping that James I would change things up and that he would purify the English church of all Catholic practices. Now, the Catholics, guys, were, were hated. No one really liked the Catholics. Now, all the religions that I mentioned um, a little while ago, they're all forms of Christianity, but really no one liked the Catholics. And the members of Parliament that were Puritans were hoping that James I would come in and purify the church of all Catholic practices. Well, after James I dies, he has a son, and his son, Charles I, now becomes King of England. He's also the King of Scotland, too. And Charles I needs money, just like his father. He needs a lot of money. And he needs one, money for one reason. He's at war with two different European countries, of course, one being France and the other one being Spain. And he needs money in order to finance these wars. And Parliament refuses to give Charles I any money. So what does he do? He dissolves Parliament. Now, guys, when you dissolve something, that means you absolutely just get rid of it. You no longer recognize it. So it's like you're throwing something away in the trash can. And he no longer recognizes Parliament. You know, if you remember what Parliament is, Parliament is a group of people that help govern with the king or queen. But he doesn't recognize Parliament anymore. So that's a big problem. Now, the only way Parliament will give Charles the first money, because he still needs money, is if he signs a very, very important document. And that very important document was called the Petition of Rights. Now, the Petition of Rights has four major points to it. First one being that Charles I could not imprison any subjects without cause. Just because he didn't like someone, he could not put them in jail. They would have to be 
put in front of a judge and a jury and found guilty or innocent. So he could not put people in prison uh, for no reason. He could also not levy taxes without parliament's consent or permission. Now, if you levy something, that means you are raising it. So he could not raise taxes without the permission of parliament. Third part of the petition of rights was that he could not house any soldiers or troops in private homes. Now, guys, back in the day, troops would be walking through towns. The army would be walking through towns. And if it was getting dark and they needed a place to stay, they could literally knock on your door. You would have to open up your door, and you would have to let soldiers stay in your home. You would have to provide shelter, a place for them to sleep, and you would also provide food. So if you think about it, you're not given the freedom of saying, no, you can't stay at my house. So now people's rights are being taken away. So according to the petition of rights, no troops or soldiers could stay at your house without permission. And finally, last point of the petition of rights was that Charles I could not impose martial law during time of peace. Martial law basically means that the military will take over the government. So that is not allowed. So of course, Charles I needs money. Of course, he has to sign this petition of rights, this document, which limits his power in order to get this money. So he does, but he's basically crossing his fingers behind his back when he signs it, because right when he signs it, and right when he gets the money, in 1629, Charles dissolves Parliament once again. He gets rid of Parliament, no longer recognizes Parliament. And Charles imposes all kinds of fees and fines on the English people in order to get money. So by him dissolving Parliament, he no longer can raise taxes. Because remember, if you want to raise taxes, you have to get Parliament's consent. So now the only way for him to get money is to fine his people, um, to charge people fees for all kinds of different things. And he needs that money to finance these wars. Now, I mentioned before that Charles offends the Puritans, and the Puritans were, were people that lived all throughout England, and the Puritans, guys, is a form of Christianity once again. And he offends the Puritans by upholding the rituals of the Angelican Church. Now, Angelican is another form of Christianity. And he also tried to force the Presbyterian Scots to accept a version of the Angelican prayer book. So now what he's doing is that he is taking the people of Scotland, and he's taking the people of England, and he's trying to force them to believe in one religion. And that's a big no-no. When you start messing with people's religions and their beliefs, they are going to rebel, and they are going to fight back. And that's exactly what's going to happen. The Scots will rebel, and the Scottish assemble a huge, huge army. And once they as assemble a big army, they threaten to invade England. Now that's not good, because if that happens, a civil war will break out. So now, of course, Charles needs money, because he needs money to fight off the Scots if they invade England. Now remember, guys, he controls and he's the king of Scotland and England, and no one is happy with Charles I. Charles I is, is hated by many of his people. So he needs money, and the only way for him to get any money, because people refuse to, to give him any more money, is to ask Parliament for it and to get permission. And, of course, Parliament is going to pass laws to limit the king's power. Now, if they give him any money, they're going to make sure that Charles I will follow the rules and laws and that he will go by whatever document that he is signing. And people were very upset and mad and furious with Charles. And this is going to lead to the English Civil War. Now remember, civil war means that you are fighting against your own people. Okay? So the people that were loyal to Charles were called the Royalists or the Cavaliers. And the people that opposed Charles, they were called the Roundheads. And the roundheads were Puritans, and the Puritans that were in Parliament. And they were called roundheads. That was kind of a nickname because of the haircuts that they had back in the day. So you're going to have two groups of people that live in England, 
and Scotland, and they are fighting against each other. So here comes along a new person, a very important person, and he is the Puritan general, and his name is Oliver Cromwell. And Cromwell's job is to find Charles I and to bring him in and put him in front of a jury where he will be found guilty. And finally, Cromwell's able to find Charles. They catch him, and they charge him with treason. Now, treason, you guys, is probably one of the most, is one of the worst things that you can possibly commit in your country. Because when you commit treason, that means you are betraying your own country. And they found him guilty of treason, and they sentenced Charles I to death because it was so extreme of what he was doing. This was the first time ever in English history that a monarch, a reigning monarch, faced a public trial and execution. Now, after Charles I was executed, there's no more leader. There's no more king or queen. There's no more monarch. And someone needs to take over. Now, of course, Oliver Cromwell takes on that role. And he becomes leader of England. And the first thing that he does is he abolishes the monarchy. He gets rid of it. And he establishes a new government that is called the Commonwealth. And this was a republic form of government, a republican form of government. Now, republican, we should remember from when we talked about Rome, a republic is when you elect representatives, and those representatives make decisions for you. Okay, so now he's going from, Cromwell's going from a monarchy to a form of democracy. But that is very short-lived. Okay? Cromwell, since he is a general, is going to be backed up by his military. And soon he's going to turn his, his leadership into a dictatorship because he's backed up by the army. And a dictatorship is almost worse than a king or queen. And he is going to rule England as a dictatorship. And he will use his military to threaten people to be loyal to him. Now, Cromwell and the Puritans looked or sought to reform society by making laws that promoted Puritan morality. So he was all about the Puritans, which once again is a form of Christianity. So when he takes over, he wants to make sure that everything in England is pure. And he abolishes a couple things, a couple activities, such as theater, sporting events, and dancing. He felt that those three things were impure and that you should not be doing that because that's not okay. Now, Cromwell showed a lot of religious tolerance towards other forms of Christianity in England. So he didn't condemn it. But he showed tolerance, which means he kind of put up with it, except for one group. And, of course, that was the Catholics. And he did not tolerate the Catholics at all. Now, in 1659, Parliament is, is fed up with Oliver Cromwell. They don't like the way he's ruling, and they want a king back. They want a monarch back. But remember what they did to Charles I. They executed Charles I. But Charles I had a son. And in 1659, Parliament asked the older son, Charles I, to rule England. And his name is Charles II. Now, Charles II, when he becomes king, he also brings back the monarchy. He brings back the old ways. And that time period is known as the Restoration time period. Now, during Charles II's reign, when he was king, Parliament passes a guarantee of freedom, which is known as habeas corpus. And under this law of Habeas Corpus Act, the monarch could not put someone in jail simply for opposing the ruler. So just because you speak up against the king or queen, you cannot be punished for that. So if you think about that, now citizens are being given freedom of speech. Now, when Charles II dies... He has no children, kind of like what happened with Elizabeth, the first monarch that we talked about. He has no 
children at all. So it goes to his closest relative, and his closest relative is his brother, who is James II. Now, James II, guys, just like Charles I, is hated by the English people, really for one reason. James II is a Catholic, and they don't like Catholics at all. So when he comes in and takes over as king, he starts to appoint a bunch of his Catholic friends to high office jobs. So he gives his buddies jobs because they are his friends, but his friends are also Catholics, just like him, and they don't like that, and they're scared um, that Catholics are going to be ruling England. So, of course, when Parliament protests against him being king and what he's doing with the Catholic jobs in the church, James dissolves Parliament just like the people before him, just like Charles I continued to do. They got rid of Parliament, no longer recognizes Parliament. And the English people were very scared and terrified um, for one reason. James's wife gives birth to a son, which means... When James II dies, his son will take over. And it's going to be a long line of Catholic monarchs. And that is what they are scared of. They don't want Catholics to rule England. So what happens is, and we haven't mentioned this before, but James II has an older daughter. And his older daughter's name is Mary. And Mary is not a Catholic. Mary is a Protestant. And Protestantism is another form of Christianity. And Parliament loves the fact that Mary is Protestant. And Mary is married to William. And William is a prince of the Netherlands. And they want William and Mary to come into England and overthrow her dad, James II. And they want to replace James II with Mary and William as being king and queen of England. Now, Mary agreed to do this. Mary agreed to overthrow her own father, who was a Catholic, who was disliked by many people. But before they even got into England with their military, with their army, James II fled. He left England and he escaped to France. Which means William and Mary are now king and queen, but not quite yet. So the overthrow of King James II was known as the Glorious Revolution. Now, no one died. There was no bloodshed. There was no fighting whatsoever. Before when Mary and the, and the military even got to England, James II took off, and he went to France. So what happens is that William and Mary will recognize Parliament as their partner in governing, and vice versa. Parliament will recognize William and Mary. They're partners. They work with each other. They compromise. They make rules and laws, and they govern England. But Parliament is going to force William Mary to sign a very, very important document, one of the most important documents in history, which is known as the English Bill of Rights. And they do this in 1689. And William and Mary sign the English Bill of Rights, but it does one thing for them. It limits their power. They don't have as much power as they did before. So now they're not going to be an absolute monarch, but rather they're going to be a constitutional monarch, meaning they have to follow a list of rules and laws. So a couple points about the English Bill of Rights. No suspending Parliament's laws at all. So you can no longer dissolve Parliament if you want to as a king or queen. No raising of taxes without specific grant or permission from Parliament. No interfering with freedom of speech in Parliament. And no penalty for a citizen who petitions a king about grievances or complaints. So if you want to, you can actually complain about what the king or queen is doing. And there is going to be no punishment or consequence towards you whatsoever. So this is a big deal. It gives people the right of freedom of speech. After 1688, no British monarch could rule without the consent of parliament. Remember, guys, parliament and the king or queen work together and vice versa. The parliament has to work with the king or queen also. So that's going to go ahead and conclude um, our lecture on the English monarchy. Please feel free to go back if you miss any questions and uh, review this.